describe capitalism as a harmonious system, because we had a capitalist who's willing to provide uh, control of the means of production, and he provides the materials, and the laborer works for that capitalist, and is given a portion of the value that he creates, and the capitalist also gets value himself, so everybody's happy, right? Um, Marx had a different idea, he had a different view of this economic system. So I'm going to start with showing a little, very, very simple, I don't want to lose anyone this early, just because, you know, the board. So we're going to imagine a chair factory. This is what we mean by the means of production. Who owns what exactly is going on in the economy? So we have input costs. This is what Marx calls cost of capital. We have value added by the laborer. These together produce the final price at market equilibrium. Okay. So we're going to say that it costs twenty dollars in woods, in wood, nails, glue, uh, the tools that are used to produce this chair. We're going to say it's twenty dollars. Now I get these materials. I work on them and it's sold for a final price, it looks good. Value added for now, we're gonna say that this chair sells for a total of $50 on the marketplace, competitive that way. So you would assume that 20 plus y equals 50, it's 30. I added $30 in labor, value added to this chair, and now it's being able to be sold. But this breaks down this value added, right? It goes into compensation, and surplus. Surplus is what a laborer is not compensated for in this equation. Even though he added this value, he does not get that. It goes to somebody else. Take it. So we're going to see exactly where the surplus goes. This is what Marxists, this process of extracting surplus, this is what Marxists consider exploitation. Um, for actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a real life example of this. So I once worked uh, for a uh, setting up, I was, I was setting up a gymnastics gym for a girl's gymnastics meet. So this is manual labor, I'm carrying heavy things, putting them into place. And we agreed upon a price, or we agreed upon a wage, $25 an hour to be doing this. Um, after the transaction was made, I was compensated 13. There was no government involved, there was no taxes taking out. I just had no power because I already produced the labor, and she gave me 13. Everyone can agree, even if you don't subscribe to the belief that surplus in and of itself is exploitation, you can agree that me getting scammed like that, that's, that's exploitation, she exploited me, right? So the profound conclusion from this equation is that when I hired to do a job, I'm never going to be fully compensated for what I provide. Otherwise, there's no point in me working there, right? The person would just do it themselves, right? There's always going to be a surplus extracted that isn't fully. So we're going to check out some uh, economic systems and apply the labor theory of value to them. So let me hit my So we start with feudalism. For those of you who are not aware of what the means of production means in terms of feudalism, the king owns all the land and peasants are giving a, given a plot of land to work for the king. 
So for the first three days of the week, the workers, they work for themselves. They make sure that all their needs are met. That's what their labor is for. For the next three days of the week, they work exclusively for the king. That's the surplus. And on Sunday, they go to church and they try to trick them into thinking that this whole process is a-okay. We move on to, oh, here's a little uh, slide for you guys, um, of the, uh, the serfs of feudalism. This is essentially, essentially the slaves of feudalism. Uh, the, Lord, the lords worked hard to get where they're at. They shouldn't have to pay taxes to the king. If they had more gold, then we would do it to common sense. This is just poking fun at Reaganomics and all that. Um, so then we move on to slavery, where there was a slave master and a slave, right? And yeah, I'm not gonna joke about that. There's no meme that's allowed for that one. So there's obviously a surplus extracted, a slave, he is given, the tools, he's given the input costs, and he works, he makes sure that his meet, needs are met with uh, food and whatnot, and everything else goes to the slave master, right? We can, it's pretty easy to see that it's, it's exploitation, even though that the slave owner, or the slave master, he provided the input costs, he, he took all this risk, right? Why is he entitled to someone else's surplus? Then we move on to um, modern capitalism, or no, no, sorry. We're gonna move on to uh, early capitalism. This is fundamentally different. But both of these are characterized by private ownership of the means of production. What I mean by that is that it's one person doing all that uh, labor. He's, he provides the input, he works on it, and when it's sold, he gets everything back, right? So there's, a, according to a Marxist, there's no exploitation involved in this. So that's a nice glimpse. This started in about 600 AD. You could call it a failure for about a thousand years until about 1600 AD where it took off. Um, we move on to modern capitalism. Uh, the transition, essentially what Engels laid out in socialism, utopian and scientific, is the transition from early capitalism to modern capitalism. What happened is, even though the means of production were socialized, as in a group of people work collectively together, only one person owns the means of production, and he decides who is compensated what, right? So he calls that a contradiction, and we'll get more into that later. Um, so, okay. All right, and then we're gonna move on to social democracy. My friend Carl is from Sweden. It's a social democratic uh, country. A lot of people like Bernie Sanders, AOC, they call this democratic socialism, but according to the Swedes themselves, they're social democrats. They have no Marxist tie in their, con uh, their constitution. They have private ownership of the means of production just like the United States, but they provide social safety nets like free healthcare, free education, et cetera. It, it increases uh, equality of opportunity, which I like, although we'll get more into why capitalism is fundamental, not good. So first and foremost, in my opinion, and according to every Marxist, it's fundamentally based on exploitation. There's an extraction of surplus, and in my view, that is exploitation. Now we look at uh, inequality, right? For those of you unaware, uh, France in 1790, right before the revolution, they were cutting off the heads of um, those kings and whatnot to the top 10%, you could say, because they were making life so difficult for the majority. They were hoarding all the wealth. And now, this is a 2016 graph, it's, it's only grown, but we had more wealth inequality than they did in France before the revolution. So this is, it might be hard to see, but this middle graph is what Americans think that the distribution is. The left is the ideal distribution, which is more uh, tight, it's not so uh, stagnant, I suppose. 
and the actual wealth distribution is on the right where you see that the top 10% control uh, most of the money while the bottom 90 have a 20, I think, uh, or sorry, a 10th of that wealth. Um, now you could say that um, a lot of Jordan Peterson fans might say that, well, inequality in and of itself is, it's not bad because it's across all hierarchy, right? However, I would say it is bad when compensation, this middle uh, light blue line, is um, it's torn apart from productivity. We're no longer reward for how, rewarded for how productive we are at work. Uh, our compensation has stayed stagnant since the 1980s, the Reagan era, if that says anything to you, um, while productivity has doubled. So that, that might be an indication that the, the system has gone corrupt. In Canada, between 1976 and 2019, the real wage of the median worker only grew by 6%. Meanwhile, the value of their labor, their productivity, increased by 60. So we can say that something's going on here, right? Now, uh, in 1990, the average CEO made 40 times the salary, 45 times the salary of his average worker. Today, they make 350 times the salary of their average worker. So what's happening there? It, it looks like the inequality is only speeding up exponentially. I also want to point out that it's fundamentally in contrast with democracy, right? This is what Marx called the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie are the owning class. They own the means of production. Those are the top 10%, you could say. Um, and basically, here's this. I, I, I want to see a raise of hand. Who thinks in the crowd that their values are reflected in legislation? Yeah. <laughs> According to this graph, 5% agree that their values are reflected in the legislation. Meanwhile, the wealthy 10%, 78% agree that their values are reflected in the legislation. This is all done through lobbying, bribing Congress, rigging the elections, all that. Not, not rigging the election in terms of vote numbers, but rigging the election in terms of who gets money and who gets elected, who gets uh, to the primaries, right? I think that the only reason that Bernie Sanders did not win in the 2016, and he did not become the primary, was because he wouldn't sell out. He reflected the values of the population far better than Hillary Clinton, far better than any other candidate, and yet he was not the primary. Um, some support uh, to that claim that we have a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. 91% of elected presidents spend the most compared to their candidates, uh, uh, to other candidates on their campaign. So we can see that if you have money, you can win, right? <laughs> Happened with Donald Trump, it's pretty, pretty clear. Um, okay, I wanted to point out that a lot of uh, Jordan Peterson types, I suppose, um, libertarian, conservative, all that, they emphasize this equality of opportunity, right? Equality of opportunity. We don't want equality of outcome, we want equality of opportunity. First and foremost, I want to say that Marxists, Marx nor Engels nor any Marxist in history nor I advocate for equality of outcome. I don't want to stabilize a hierarchy flat. That's not what I want. I want an elimination of surplus value, right? Now, I argue that Capitalism does not have a quality of opportunity. The very thing that they're trying to conserve does not have what apparently their values are. So, say for example, I'm broke and I'm in health troubles. I'm near death and I go to a hospital and they won't treat me, right? But a rich person could be in the same situation and yet have a far, higher opportunity to live. I just wanted to point that out, a, a fundamental discrepancy. 
So we can see with this graph that 40% of African Americans during, uh, between 1970 and 1990 experienced poverty. Um, why could that be? Is it because <coughs> they're inferior? Is it because their culture promotes laziness? I would argue no. I'd like to bring in another uh, philosophical uh, development of Marx from Hegel, uh, a concept of historical materialism. It, it's fundamentally the idea that if you are under a certain material condition, only a certain number of outcomes uh, are possible, right? So I would argue that this graph probably traces back to slavery, right? When the slaves were, um, when the slaves were freed, they were still thought of as less than human and they couldn't obtain jobs. And when they did, they became sharecroppers, which we learned in my liberal at most AP United States history uh, class that it was just an extension of slavery. It's just that the ownership of the person was not outright, it was implicit, it wasn't explicit, right? Engels in Principles of Communism said the slave is sold once and for all, the worker must sell himself daily and hourly, right? I wanna emphasize the must. I'm born into a particular situation. I do not have the resources to start a business and be compensated for my entire surplus, no, no. I have to go work for somebody else and they will pay me a portion of my productivity. So I'd like to say that that probably keeps us in poverty, right? Probably keeps us in poverty if we're not compensated. Now this graph shows if you are poor, if you're in, impoverished between the age of eight and 14, the likelihood of you staying um, impoverished by the time you're 20 is 46%. By the time you're 35, it's 45, 45%, right? So I'd, I'd like to point out that when I must sell myself daily and hourly, I'm being exploited and I'm being kept in a position that I'd rather not be in. I'd like to move on to the idea that workers have, I'd like to save questions until later. <laughs> um, I'd like to point out that workers have very little say in their wage, right? Reagan <coughs> culturally, and I believe legislated um, against unions. Um, and we saw that earlier in a graph. Union membership tanked, that's when our hourly compensation has stayed stagnant, right? So, <laughs> so okay, uh, Republicans, they're against unions because the idea is, okay, well now they can't afford to have business here or they'll just take a small profit cut. So we're gonna move everything over to China. Now that we've become a service economy, right? This is Reagan's goal, he said, um, we can't unionize anymore, or we have to unionize at this point. We can't ship our jobs over to China. Amazon can't have them unionized because we need the service workers here. We need the factory workers here. We need the truck drivers here, all that. He doesn't want to take a profit cut. So what has been happening as of late, uh, uni uh, Amazon managers have been tearing down legislation, or sorry, been tearing down union literature uh, posted in break rooms, which is illegal. Um, another example of Amazon fighting unions is um, a union organizer was fired for organizing a union, once again illegal, and uh, kicked off the premises, and while he was leaving, they arrested him for trespassing, which is also illegal. Um, and another point on Amazon fighting against unions, they created this app in which workers can speak to one another. But they have banned words such as, I hate, union, compensation, pay raise, bullying, harassment, this is dumb, 
<laughs> injustice, diversity, fairness, vaccine, representation, unfair, plantation, slave, slave labor, master, freedom, restrooms. <laughs> so, uh, all my conservatives in the crowd, possible conservatives, when you fight for freedom of speech, you also fight for Jeff Bezos suppressing his worker's speech and trying to unionize and being compensated just a little more. They're not even trying to make this a socialist, a socialist um, workplace. They just want to be compensated a few more dollars that they rightfully produce and should be compensated for. Okay. Now I want to move on to the inevitability of automation. This has been coming up more and more. So capitalism's whole goal is to outproduce your competitors, whether that be automating, uh, becoming more produ productive, et cetera. So when you do that, you drive the price down. Another company has to drive the price down as well. So um, that's... Marx's theory of the race to zero or the tendency of the profit rate to fall to zero, although it happens much slower than he outlined it. Um, but it's still inevitable. Um, so my point for the inevitability of automation, why is this fundamentally bad under capitalism? Why is this dooming us in some sense? It's that the means of production are privately controlled. When we have automation, we're gonna lay off all our workers and they're not gonna be able to contribute to the economy. The economy collapses. We'll see a huge depression. What is that when we see a fall in aggregate demand? <laughs> depression. So, what does this man, Andrew Yang, his little, uh, what's his idea? It's UBI, Universal Basic Income. So the idea is that I will be getting $1,000 a month and I'll be able to contribute to the economy at least a little bit. So in the case of automation and workers being laid off, we're going to be assigned $1,000 a month to contribute to the economy, a poverty wage. I can't work for anyone anymore. I'm assigned a poverty wage in, able, in, in order to perpetuate the system that has kept me and my fellow workers down for hundreds of years, right? Okay, now I want to define exactly what socialism is. Uh, so... A lot of people with many different ideas have called themselves socialists over uh, the past several hundred years, actually. And, oh, sorry, but they all share in common a desire to move past capitalism, right? This is why I don't think that social democrats, uh, Bernie Sanders is a democratic socialist. He doesn't want to move past capitalism, he wants to reform it, right? Therefore, he's not a socialist. How did Marx describe uh, socialism? It's when the means of production are controlled democratically by the workers, right? <coughs> so I do want to look at what the USSR got right and wrong. I think it's important because this was the first macro experience or experiment of um, a socialist ideal. This is Marx and Engels. Um, what did they get right? Well, they allowed women in the workforce 40 years before America did. Um, they gave free health care, free education. We still don't have that 100 years later. Um, and they tried, but I think failed, at installing what they call a dictatorship of the proletariat. The idea is Fundamentally, the, the, uh, the word dictator or dictatorship has changed over over time. It was Marx saying this in, what, the 19th century? So the word has shifted meaning. Basically, dictatorship of the proletariat means power to the workers, right? Now, I don't think that the Soviet Union uh, achieved a dictatorship of the proletariat in a um, reasonable manner. So let's look at what they got wrong. They simply replaced the managers and owners with bureaucrats. They forcefully took the means of production and they just stuck in government workers, right? So this is what Trotsky and many other Marxists, including myself, consider state capitalism. The same top-down rigid hierarchy 
in which surplus is being stolen and the workers are being exploited was just simply masked and now it's, it's the state who controls it. It's not much different, right? So now I want to move on to um, what capitalism got right. This is commonly brought up by uh, defenders of capitalism. They say that poverty, abject poverty, defined by the UN as less than $1.90 a day. First and foremost, I want to ask, can any of you guys live on $55 a month? Probably not. I, I wouldn't consider that a, a value or a reasonable number. But they alleviated abject poverty by 80% in the last 40 years. What I want to point out is that almost all of this came from China. They do have free market, right? They have, they, it is capitalist in essence, but they have a dictatorship of the proletariat, right? The workers control the owners in China. If you guys are familiar with Jack Ma, the owner of Alibaba, he was kidnapped for two weeks only to return to immediately instate um, heavy work reformation, increase in wage, etc. So you could say that the workers control the owners in China. So it's fundamentally different to the governance in America. All right, real wage growth. Real wage growth in China over the past 40 years. Oh. Okay, this is not uh, a full graph. But over the past 40 years, the real wage growth in China has quadrupled while America's real wage has stayed stagnant. So, my conclusion of this analysis of capitalism is that it initially alleviates poverty through rapid industrialization, but inevitably its utility diminishes. In the United States, capitalism has outlived its utility. See, we see rapidly increasing inequality. The top 1% over COVID gained $1 trillion, while the bottom 50% lost $800 billion. Uh, we see stagnant or decreasing real wages. Um, CEOs are being paid uh, record highs, and our wage has stayed stagnant. It's not moving. So, what steps must be taken to alleviate exploitation, to benefit the working class, to move past capitalism without repeating the mistakes of the 20th century socialist, the Soviet Union, um, who forcibly took the means of production and just put in government workers? The answer are worker cooperatives, right? So what is a worker cooperative, you might ask? It's a mode of production in which the workers organize collectively and they compile their money to provide for the input costs and they share the profits. There's no one at the top to uh, pay an absurd amount. There's no surplus being extracted. The workers are in control of their own company. So that is why I would say that a worker cooperative is socialist because the workers own the means of production and they're entitled to their surplus value. They operate by the maxim that Karl Marx laid out for socialism. From each according to their ability to each according to their labor, right? What worker cooperatives are exploitation. So these are nice little pictures. Um, how do they work? Right? There's democracy in the workplace. Now, there can be a combination of direct democracy, representative democracy. Um, nevertheless, it's democracy at work. It's not top down, it's bottom up. So there's no one to pay a billion dollars to for the risk that they took um, in starting that business, even though you know they were born into that too. Um, there's no one to do that. Right? So that billion dollars is redistributed among the people. Um, according to their labor, of course, not just a quality of outcome. No, 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 no. It's pretty simple. At the end of the year, you find the revenue, you subtract the cost, you get the profits, you divide that among all the hours worked, and then you find the hourly rate and then assign that to each worker. So it's not a quality of outcome. People who work different hours, say six hour, a six hour day, and they do that regularly, and people who work 12 hour days, they're not paid the same. Now, how do we sell this to a Americanized, anti-socialist um, culture? 
Well, you give them the freedom of choice, right? The freedom of choice to work for or shop at a democratic workplace that's exploitation free, where workers are generally treated much better, or they can work at a top-down, rigid, hierarchical workplace like Amazon, where they, you know, exploit their workers. It's your choice. Where do you want to work? Where do you want to shop at? I want to point out why this business model will outcompete the capitalist is because uh, each worker, their wage is dependent on their productivity. The company is actually dependent on them, right? So they need to work harder, they need to innovate more so that they can be more productive without putting in as much strain, right? Uh, and this outcompetes the capitalist model because you guys ever heard the phrase minimum wage, minimum effort? I'm sure it's been heard. If I'm gonna be guaranteed a small wage, I'm not gonna work hard. Simple as that, right? Now I can work twice as hard, you might see a dollar or two increase in my hourly wage if I'm there for a year. There's just not as much incentive. Whereas in a democratic workplace, I'm gonna work much harder so that I can obtain the fruits of my labor. Right, now some people say that this is just a fever dream, right? No one's ever tried this. I'd like to point out the Mondragon Corporation. It was started post-World War II, where Spain was torn apart. This is specifically the Basque region, I believe it's northern. And a Roman Catholic priest and six other people decided we're gonna be dead before the capitalists come invest here. So we're gonna start and collectively own the means of production ourselves. And they established a worker cooperative starting with six people. They currently have 100,000 workers essentially owning the entire Basque region of Spain. You could call this a socialist utopia, right? Except it's here, it's here. So I do wanna point out that when you're in this representative dem democratic uh, style and you have 100,000 workers, it can't just be anarchy. There has to be some sort of control. But you elect your control and you can elect them out, right? You can elect the structure of the workplace. You can elect how much will I be paid? How much will I invest into another company? Or how much will I invest into expanding my company? Now you could say that well, this could go just as wrong as the Soviet Union style, right? Because we have representatives. Mondragon decided that the highest paid person can be paid only eight times more than the least paid, right? So there's still an equality. It's not equality of outcome. It's equality of opportunity. Now you can say, well, I'm against inequality, but you know, a matter of eight is a lot less than a matter of 350 with the CEOs under this capital. I also want to point out that capitalism is uh, inherently imperialistic, right? This is what Lenin laid out in State and Revolution. The idea, or, or sorry, no, it was in a different book. It was capitalism, or imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. That's the case. So the idea is that I can go overseas to make more money, I can exploit people better, right? But why would the workers get rid of their own job? Why would they elect themselves to let, they wouldn't, right? This is a peaceful transition. And I wanna point out in the case of automation, which is inevitable, we see it every day, we see truck drivers are about to be out of their job because of self-driving cars and trucks. In the case of automation under this mode of production, the workers will still own the means of production and they'll still profit from it. Even if they put in just a tiny bit of labor, they got a whole lot of productivity out of it. And they're entitled to their entire productivity. So we can see that the economy still moves forward if all workplaces were established like this. Now I'm not suggesting that automation is gonna happen tomorrow, nor am I suggesting that this, uh, this uh, worker cooperative model is going to take off in the United States tomorrow. Right. This has to be built up over time. But that's exactly what we should do. We should build this up over time. And that's
that's why I'm here talking about it today. Um, I'd like people to know about this. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm thinking about becoming uh, a lawyer and working specifically in worker cooperatives because well, of my beliefs in this lecture. Now I ask you guys, would you rather work at a workplace where you're entitled to your entire labor or be fired and given $1,000 a month to perpetuate the economy, you know, a starvation wage? Would you rather, what would you rather do? I'm asking Carl, what would you rather do? <laughs> Put this at the end, no, that's not no. Carl. Oh, uh, the third one sounds really good. Yeah, okay. So I, I do want to point out this is fundamentally different than the Soviet area of, era of socialists, right? Because we're not forcibly taking means of production from anyone. We're not installing government control. There's no totalitarianism here. It's just the workers owning the means of production. This is a micro approach to a macro problem. You might say that's wrong, but we saw what happened in the Soviet Union. I, I think it'll be repeated again if we go that way. So because this is different than the Soviet area, era of socialists, and most people are against just the word socialism, right? We jump at that word. We jump at that word, Cold War did a good job. <laughs> I'd like to call this uh, brand of socialism cooperatism, because of worker cooperatives, I'd like to call it that. Um, and that way, we don't scare off the majority, right? So a common critique I have of leftists, I am a leftist myself, but a common critique of um, leftists is that um, some seek to destroy, right? We see that with like Carson Brown, for example, right? The Marxist Leninist, he's, he's um, a Soviet era socialist, right? That's his ideology. Um, I don't seek to destroy, I seek to construct, I seek to build more workplaces in which the means of production are owned by the workers. Right? So I often hear people say, beat the rich, right? A lot of leftists say that. I would rather say, beat the rich, not physically, but in uh, economic competition. I, I'd like to see the, Democra or the democratic work model have to be capitalist, and I think that it is quite possible. So to all of the Soviet era socialists in the crowd, if there are any, I, I don't think there are, but even if there was, I do want to point out that even if there was a successful Leninistic type of revolution, in spite of the majority jumping at the word socialism, in spite of the police and the huge amount of army reserve, your regime would immediately be overthrown by the Trumplicans, who obviously weren't afraid to a coup, a democratically elected president only a few centimeters left of Trump. Under the current material conditions of the United States, cooperatism is the only way of truth. To all of those who are sick of the bourgeoisie disempowering the working class, sick of the low wages, the unlivable wages, corporate greed, and price gouging, in the words of Karl Marx, you have nothing to lose but your chains. You have the world to win. Workers of the world unite. Thank you. Challenge to the labor theory of value. Okay. Yeah. Could I, the could I access the board? Oh yeah, he gets the whiteboard.